the, the only race that is worth winning is the race precisely to be carbon neutral. And if at the end of the day we bring the rest of the world with us, that's probably the, the, the best thing we can provide as Europeans for climate action globally. Mr. Confant, thanks for your time. You lead the Environment Committee in the European Parliament and climate change is on the top of our agenda. The Parliament in the past year has passed several legislations to cut emissions, to help people transition into a green energy, to reduce fossil fuels dependency. Our fellow citizens are also worried about the protection of nature, which is a main element in the fight against climate change at the end. Yeah. One of the main problems that we have in our days is plastic waste. Mm. Can we do more to reduce plastic waste? The European Union has already come a long way since banning single-use plastics, but people would like to see more and even to, to help more on that. And, and, and people are right, and that's exactly what we are doing. Uh, last term, we banned some very iconic single-use plastics, like straws, for instance. By the way, we still have plastic straws in a lot of places in Europe, so it means that this regulation has been set, uh, voted, but it's not always uh, implemented. So that's the first element. But then still we need obviously to go beyond this. And that's exactly what we are doing. Another negotiation which is ongoing, you know, the Green Deal as a whole, it's 75, 75 legislative proposals. So we are negotiating a lot of them right now. One of them is precisely dealing with packaging. So paper packaging and plastic packaging. And the goal is to massively reduce single-use plastic packaging, sometimes even banning it for specific products, mm -hmm. and making sure that it is more recyclable and more recycled. Because it's not only because it's recyclable that it is de facto recycled. So we need to, to work on all the value chain. Less plastic at the beginning, in the it's supermarkets, in the supermarkets, you know, everyday life mm -hmm. to, to package uh, things we buy. When plastic st is still needed, making sure that it is recyclable and then making sure it is really recycled to make again a circular loop to get back to a, a, a new plastic, but without having to use more oil, because I, we all know that mm -hmm. plastic means oil. So that's the purpose of this regulation. And I can tell you that it is a fierce battle against some lobbying groups that are trying to do whatever they can to kill this thing. And it is unacceptable. And the solution for uh, reducing this uh, plastic uh, wrap and so on products would be to replace it by paper? So because that could be also a problem. Exactly. So you have it. one option, which yeah. is the best one, which is to reduce the quantity of packaging. Mm -hmm. So moving from a over packaging, for instance, if you when you receive a parcel from uh, Amazon, for instance, you have sometimes a small object you buy, you bought, and then around it you have plastics and then you have a, a, a parcel and then you have again uh, yeah. something else and then you have a parcel. Well, uh, come on, you are buying things and you'll receive a parcel this way. So yeah. one of the uh, proposal that is now negotiating is precisely to set a limit in the quantity of packaging you can use for a specific object. Mm -hmm. But, you know, sometimes, obviously, we need packaging. Uh, you cannot just get rid of packaging for obvious reasons, including sanitary reasons. When it is needed and when we can't do something else, then we need to switch as much as we can from plastic to paper, but making sure that this paper is really recycled and not made of paper plus plastic. It's a big, big discussion. Some groups are trying to convince us that the definition of paper should include plastic. You know, that's the kind of lobbying we are facing. When you, when you take a bag, sometimes within the bag, okay, it's, it's paper, but then there is 10% of plastic. And then it cannot be recycled because it's way, yeah. way too costly to separate again plastic. That a lot, yeah. and, and that's crazy. There are producers in Europe doing it without plastic. We shouldn't be afraid of moving from a, a cup uh, with plastic to a cup without plastic. Let's uh, take this responsibility. Your proposal does it also foresee something to not increase the deforestation because if we're using more paper, we need to, to tear more forests down. That's why the first element is uh, limiting packaging 
to get there, we need to promote reuse. Years ago, when you went to a, a restaurant, uh, you didn't have this plus paper thing. You just have a traditional uh, glass uh, element, for instance, that was uh, uh, then uh, kept in the restaurant or in the shop and then uh, reused. And it, it means much, much less waste. So let's but promote this. It means more this. work for the restaurants and more energy and water no, consumption. No, much less water and much less energy compared to using a cup that usually comes from China, by the way. So made half the world traveling. Then you use it once, 10 seconds for, to, to drink a coffee. And then you put, you put it in the bin. It's much more uh, energy consuming than just washing it. So we need to reorganize some sort of common sense that we lost. And I must say that uh, France is one of the very few countries having already that kind of flow. And it works. If you go to a McDonald's in France or a KFC or whatever fast food you want to get, you will have not things that will be thrown just minutes after, but that can be reused. If it works in certain McDonald's, why it shouldn't be working in all McDonald's in Europe? Uh, a big chunk of European waste ends up in uh, other countries, in non EU countries, because we export that. Yeah. How can we make sure that this waste that is exported to, to poor countries yeah. Uh, is uh, well managed and doesn't just uh, tra transpose an European problem to poor parts of the world. So I fully share your uh, analysis and your concern. What kind of waste do we export? It's sometimes in very poor conditions in terms of management that have a direct impact on the kids uh, elsewhere in Europe, for instance. The position of the parliament is very clear. We need to ban this. We need to ban exports of waste in countries that are not equipped to treat this waste. Otherwise, it is just full hypocrisy from our side to say, OK, I'm not going to pay to treat this waste. I just exporting to, uh, to uh, Ghana. It's a very unfortunate case, uh, well known to Ghana. Uh, and then uh, it's just polluting Ghana uh, coast and polluting health of uh, uh, citizens in Ghana and how come we can accept this and we hope that we will be able to convince member states to have a clear ban on things that are not treated elsewhere on the contrary of course if we export things in Canada or in Japan or in the US where they have the same technologies that we do well no problem and we should also stop looking at waste just as a waste it's a potential resource if we want to create a circular economy so we need to use this resource precisely to create uh, things that do not require uh, mining activities or more oil or more gas. And I wanted to talk more about deforestation. Uh, European Union has been for years accused of contributing to deforestation in other parts of the world by importing products that are yeah. issued from forest areas. This year, Parliament has passed a new law that will force companies to take responsibility and to avoid that whatever they sell here comes from these areas. What is the impact that you expect from this new legislation? So it's a massive uh, piece of the Green Deal. It's the very first global law regulating exactly the, what we call imported deforestation. That it's been praised by NGOs as exactly. something historical. Exactly. As Europeans, we are the second in the world after the Chinese in terms of contribution to the deforestation of Amazonia, for instance. Why? Because we import a lot of goods coming from Amazonia. Soybean, uh, for instance, palm oil when it comes to Indonesia for other uh, for kind of uh, forest. We want to stop this because it's the opposite of what we want to get, me being more green. So we said, OK, if you cannot demonstrate that your soybean or your palm oil, or your cacao, or your coffee is not contributing to deforestation, then you cannot enter the European market anymore. Because we want to guarantee to the European consumer, to the people watching this video, that when they have a coffee or when they have a, a cocoa, it's uh, not uh, contributing, even without her or him knowing this, to uh, the deforestation of the tropical forest of this world. And what's the impact that you think this will have in global deforestation? Well, it's, it will be massive because, as I said, we are the second contributors. So if we manage to change, that will definitely reduce the pressure 
on this forest. Mm -hmm. And of course, now we are working with Brazil, with Indonesia, with Malaysia, with uh, Argentina and so on, precisely to make that work on the ground. And when needed, putting additional development money from the EU to help mm -hmm. farmers on the ground to switch from practices that contribute to deforestation to practices that do not contribute to deforestation. So it's a, a, a legal framework, but it's also something that we uh, work uh, with farmers on the ground to make sure that uh, it is implemented. Well, when the European Union tries to help halt in deforestation or protecting nature in other parts of the world, some actions can be seen as uh, protectionism or it can be accused of being interference on national affairs and national sovereignty, like we see with the environmental clause that the European Union is trying to push on the deal with Mercosur. Mercosur. It's a very uh, important question, of course. First, uh, is it protectionism? Uh, the clear answer is no. Why? Because we are setting the same rules for ourselves. Protectionism is when you set rules for imports, but you do not set the same rules for yourself. That's protectionism and that it is unfair competition for the others. But it's not what we're doing with this deforestation law. We have exactly the same regulation against deforestation in Europe and outside for our import. Another example is the, what we call the carbon border adjustment mechanism, where we say, OK, if you produce uh, steel uh, or aluminium in Europe, you pay a certain level of carbon price. But if you import the very same stone of steel or aluminium from China or India, you pay, when you enter the European market, you pay the exact same price. So it's not protectionism, it's just level playing field. But then we need to make sure to avoid the second criticism, which is, let's say, call it uh, green colonialism. Okay, that actually it's a new colonialism against developing country. Mm. Well, the fact is that uh, climate is a global issue and we are the largest market in the world. It's not something that is well known by Europeans. In terms of economic uh, value, the European market is the first one in the world, beyond the US and beyond China. So let's use this power for the goods that we import, not for the rest of the world. I mean, if there is a transaction between China and Brazil, nothing we can do. But for the goods that we import, we take a responsibility to make sure that they are greener and greener and greener. And to be honest, it is exactly what the European citizens expect from us. And if we can have a positive impact outside our borders, to my view, it's a good thing. Other than deforestation, some European companies have also been accused in the past of financing or even leading projects that caused major environmental damage and even life losses in other parts of the world. I'm thinking about landslides from minefields in Brazil or the flooding of uh, some indigenous territory in Guatemala. What can the European Union do to help preventing this from happening? It's very important, of course, that we take care of this issue. So one of the laws that we are negotiating under the umbrella of the Green Deal precisely try to address the issue you are referring to. It's called due diligence, meaning that if you are a European company and you operate outside, like in Guatemala, you need to uh, make sure that you follow very strict criteria not to have uh, frauds, not to have corruption, not to have a uh, social scandal or environmental pollution. Of course, we always need to strike the right balance between this objective and the fact that if the constraints are just way too high, then it is impossible for them to operate in a context that is just different from the uh, EU. I mean, Guatemala is definitely not uh, uh, Sweden uh, or, or Denmark. OK, so we need to take care of these values because it's the heart of the European values, like uh, fighting against uh, pollution or so fighting against uh, uh, child labor and so on. That's key. But if we go too far, then we probably put our European companies outside uh, the market and then we lose jobs. So that's the right balance we need to strike. Do you think the European Union is doing enough to, to protect our nature? Well, we are doing uh, multiple things. I will start with the fact that we are negotiating now the first ever law to restore nature in Europe. You know, so far what we have been doing is to protect nature in some spaces, so natural parks, natural 2000 zones and so on. But now we want to go further because nature is still disappearing. 
So in order to go further, we need to move from protection to restoration. So restoring ecosystems that have been degraded, meaning that there is no life anymore, there is no water anymore, and to bring nature back again on this ecosystem. That's a very first example. A second one is the fight against pesticides, the main driver that is de facto killing nature today in Europe is the use of pesticides. And by the way, it's logical because it is made for this. We need to decrease the use of pesticides in Europe based on the first law that will harmonize systems to reduce pesticides in Europe. Today, we have only three countries that have a legal framework to reduce pesticides in Europe. With this European law, we will move from three to 27. So it's a massive change. A group of uh, young people from Portugal just recently took 32 European governments to court over climate inaction. They come from a, an area in Portugal that was uh, ravaged by forest fires and extreme heat. And they argue that the failure of these governments of taking a stronger action against the climate change is what led to this situation and caused them mental distress and health risks. What do you think of this course of action? So first, there will be more and more uh, legal actions of that kind. You think so? Because uh, it will come uh, from citizens against states and also against companies. And there is no reason for citizens, starting with the young generation, not to go to court and to ask for justice. They are right. And that's why we are doing much more now than what we did five years ago. That's so it's why good that they're doing that. We, we are doing the Green Deal. If there was no problem, including in terms of justice, including in terms of human rights and capacity for this new generation to live on a healthy planet, why should we bother? So that's so, a good pressure. Of course, it's a good pressure. It's a good pressure on us as Europeans and member states and the European institution and a good pressure on companies as well to act more because we always need to act more and more. We know that we are not there yet. When you look at what we have done so far, it's massive. Uh, we mentioned the uh, uh, carbon tax on border. We mentioned, uh, we didn't even mention uh, cars uh, being now zero emissions, 100% by 2035, but we mentioned some of what we are doing on pesticides, on plastics, so much, on deforestation. Yeah. There's so much that have been done, but still we need to go uh, even further than that. That's why, for instance, we are now working with the European Commission on the next phase of the Green Deal for the next term after the uh, European elections next year. And to conclude this interview, the COP28 is about to start the UN Conference for the Climate Change. Yeah. What's at stake this year and what's the results that Parliament would like to see coming from this conference? So I would love to tell you that I expect a success in COP28. You're not optimistic. I'm not optimistic. Why? First, because it takes place in a, in, in a Gulf country where it is, there are so much dependence on oil that they are very reluctant, really, to be serious with climate action. Second, we are in a world where the fight between China and the US, as we speak, is preventing us from finding real good uh, compromises on climate. Because when China says something, the US says the opposite. And when the US says something, China says the opposite. So as European, in that context, we try to uh, be the honest broker, I would say, to find a compromise, but I'm not very optimistic, to be honest. And at the end of the day, now the core of what we have to do, and that's what we have been doing with the Green Deal, is to deliver, not just to negotiate additional things and take, taking years and years to negotiate a small piece. So it's time to pull in just the practic. Deliver, right? deliver, deliver, deliver. So new rules for industry, new rules for energy, new rules for cars, new rules for trucks, new rules for trains and so on, so that we deliver. What, we, what is the key element of the Green Deal? A Europe that is carbon neutral at the latest in 2050. But you still need to get the, the rest of the world on board. Yes, and that's why the US have the exact same objective. China has the same objective. The, the point is that we are not going to negotiate the way we are going to get there because it's not something that is possible to negotiate. We do not have to negotiate the amount of renewable energies that is coming out in China. We do not have to negotiate the way the U.S. will make a green hydrogen. Just do it. The good news is that with IRA, you know, this uh, what we call the Inflation Reduction Act, the Biden plan to invest massively in the U.S., the U.S. are now on board. For the first time, they are investing for real in green technology.
just not uh, marginal things, but massive, which is good. Then we compete because the, the only race that is worth winning is the race precisely to be carbon neutral. And if at the end of the day, we bring the rest of the world with us, because we are the largest markets, because we have a global footprint on deforestation, then that's probably the, the, the best thing we can provide as Europeans uh, for uh, climate action globally. Thank you. Thank you. From the European Parliament in Brussels, I'm Marcia Bizzotto, and this is Pascal Confon, Chair of Environment Committee in the Parliament.